August 19th marks 70 years since the US backed coup against the then Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. But this is not just any anniversary and the coup has relevance to this day. How is that? In a dramatic development, the Putai party and the party of former Prime Minister Prayuth Chanocha have reached an agreement which might pave the way for a new government. The loser in this scenario is the Move Forward Party, which was the single largest force in the recent elections. What exactly is happening in Thailand? These are our stories for the day. This is Daily Debrief. And before you watch any further, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on YouTube. On August 19, 1953, the popular nationalist Prime Minister of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, was overthrown in a CIA-supported coup. This was one of the first post-World War II coups that showed the spread of US tentacles and its desire to establish its hegemony in West Asia. The US managed to get the Shah of Iran restored, but he himself was overthrown 26 years later. The implications of this coup continue to this day, and the wars and conflicts and tensions in West Asia are a sign of this. Curiously, days before this anniversary, Iran's foreign minister was in Saudi Arabia, which is a key prong of US strategy in the region. How does the relevance of this coup, how does it connect to today's realities? We go to News Clicks, Prabir Prakayastha. Prabir, thank you so much for joining us. Now, some might even call it a bit quaint that we are discussing about a coup that took place in 1953. So much has happened since then in Iran, in the US, in the rest of the world. But I think it's very important to register that uh, in some ways, that was that marked the beginning of a trend as far as US was concerned, but also had impact in that region, which continues to continues to this day. So, could you maybe take us through why talking about this anniversary of this 1953 coup is so significant? You know, that's an interesting issue because it started, I think, two things which are very important. One is that it started making it very clear that the oil is the crux of the West Asia issues. That means oil was going to increasingly play a much more important geop geopolitical role than it had done before that. So in that sense, the Iran coup was really about oil, because Mossadegh, who was the uh, prime minister at the time, he had nationalized, he had threatened to nationalize, he hadn't actually nationalized, he just wanted to check the Anglo-Iranian oil companies' records. So the second part of it is the entry into West Asia, at that time, don't forget, it used to be called Middle East, that uh, of actually the United States, who at that point of time, Mossadegh thought would be sympathetic to the Iran, Iran, because they were not a part of the colonial powers. And he thought that he could appeal to the United States for support against what the British was, were trying to do. But what he didn't know, that already, the die had been cast and the U.S. had decided to support the coup and actually get rid of Mossadegh. So this was the, what shall we say, the rising nationalism in West Asia coming with in conflict with the desire of the Western powers to control the resources of West Asia, primarily of oil. And this is what already the United States had negotiated with Saudi Arabia, if you remember. Uh, after the Second World War, this was what uh, the, the United States had already done. So what was going to be for next 50, 60, 70 years, the politics of West Asia was set at this point. In, 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 I will not say set in stone, but was set, a course was set at this point. But both the United States becoming the essentially the leader of the West, taking over from Great Britain, France, other uh, European countries, uh, primarily from Great Britain, and of course, the oil becoming the crux of the politics in the, uh, in, in the region. And I think that is why this is important. And that's why when the Shah of Iran, who's I think 19 or 20 years old, was brought into power by essentially the US-British uh, joining in, and the whole, we know now from the CIA records, which are in public domain, most of it is in public domain now, that the role the CIA and the British intelligence agencies had played in bringing the Shah of Iran into power. 
And that, that was what led finally to the upsurge against the Shah of Iran and his getting his being thrown out. And of course, the clerical regime uh, coming into power in Iran. Also, it's important at that time, the clerical, the clerical forces were not against the United States. They were, in fact, sympathetic to the West because they're very much anti mossadegh So in that sense, they were not a player at that point of time. But getting rid of Mossadegh, the left, the only political force, because you know the Tudeh party was again smashed. All the things that the US and the and Great Britain, United Kingdom did at that point of time, meant that the only political forces that were left finally were the one which were in the mosques, the basically the clergy, that they were left as opposing Shah of Iran. And sure enough, that's what led finally to what would be seen as the uh, Shah of Iran being, being thrown out when his unpopularity became very high by the clerical forces and we then got what we have today. I mean, uh, that's an interesting starting point of uh, uh, history which of course turns out to be very bloody. We, like you said, there was the clerics taking over in Iran followed by that very brutal war between Iran and Iraq of course in which the US fully backed Saddam Hussein who was their ally at that time. And, you know, I think ever since that moment, uh, ever for decades now, relations have been pretty bad. There was a brief interim period during the Obama years and now uh, under Trump it went back again. But interesting to note that around the time of the same anniversary, the Iranian foreign minister was actually visiting Saudi Arabia. You mentioned Saudi Arabia, which was a key pole in the US strategy of retaining control over oil and containing Iran was maybe another key pole for many, many years. But now we see that these two countries are, you know, although it's not perfect, establishing some kind of relationship. So is that order also under threat, that 70-year-old order almost? You know, that's, that's a very interesting point, which I think Chas Freeman, uh, one of the doyens of US foreign policy makes recently, that finally the region is moving from Middle East to West Asia. And this is symbolic because what they are seeing is not how the West looks at them, because that's how it is Middle East. If you look from European Union or you look from the United States, it is somewhere towards the East. But if you're looking from where you actually belong, then you're a part of Asia and a part of West Asia. So here it was that the Saudis were at the point of time, the linchpin of the American policies, as we know, in, in West Asia. But Iran was also, with Shah of Iran completely aligning with the United States, Shah of Iran was also a big player. Now, the, this whole issue then becomes that who controls West Asia's oil? And the Qatar policy was very frank about it, that essentially our strategic interests are in West Asia. And therefore, anybody who interferes with our control of West Asia's oil, they are interfering in our strategic uh, resources. So what is the famous cartoon we used to see when we were kids? That their oil is their, our oil is under their sand. So that used to be the American, you know, cartoon that we used to see, but progressive forces, I guess, had put out over there. So this, this whole issue about oil became much more important after 71. As we know, the US went off the gold standard and therefore who sets the price of oil? And if it is set in dollars or other currencies became an important issue. And there you see now the Saudis slowly breaking away from setting up, doing all their business in dollars and starting to, what shall we say, uh, choose a basket of currencies depending on which country they're trading with for selling their oil. So this is also, and as you rightly said, the Saudis have had also the other issue that they are more bent upon now what would be called Saudi national interests, okay. rather than being just a religious identity-based political uh, entity and siding with the United States. So there is that uh, relative autonomy that they want to have vis-a-vis -vis the United States and the West. And in this, Iran, normalizing relationships, Iran is very important for them. Otherwise, they between the two, if there is such a conflict that was always uh, threatening to spill over into arms, uh, armed conflict, then of course it helps Israel, it helps the West, 
So this was something which they needed to do in order to be able to carve out a path for West Asia, which is different from what would be dictated by outside forces. So I think this realization that they have to create space for themselves and not depend on somebody else to give them uh, what direction they should work at is, I think, very important. You also talked about uh, Iran-Iraq war. Saddam Hussein was at that point of time essentially aligned to the United States. He, both the United Kingdom and the United States gave, gave him the poison gas, which was used to chemical weapons and poison gas, which was used widely against Iranian mm -hmm. troops. So at that point of time, they didn't talk about how it was evil, how it was bad and so on. It only, this kind of narrative only uh, arises when they talk about Syria. And again, uh, essentially cooking up a story, most likelihood. So this whole region, where the direction it took from the 50s onwards, particularly the monarchy siding with the US and the European powers, they are slowly breaking off into trying to work out for themselves what should their equation be with the world, whether it is, uh, it is Iran, uh, of course, which is a clerical force, but uh, it's a Shia force as well. Uh, Shia, but this is what we know. As well as when you talk about Saudi Arabia, you talked about that, but also United Arab Emirates, also right. Qatar. They all seem to be working out an independent path for themselves. They are not progressive forces in any sense. So not that they are making revolutionary changes either in the region or in their countries, but they just don't want to be now hanging on to the court tills of the United States and other imperialist powers. And I think that is something which is changing this region in a way that we haven't anticipated. We didn't think two years back that this would happen. So these are some of the fallouts, unexpected fallouts, in the, in the way things are shaping up in the world. And, uh, you know, part of it is the weakness of the European Union. It's no longer a major economic right. or political force. United Kingdom is a has power, which is days are gone. The glory days are long over. It's just that they haven't reconciled the, uh, themselves to it. And the United States is no longer as dominant as it was, for instance, after the Second World War, or even more after 1990. So I think a realignment is happening, and Asia and Africa are is really where the action is. And here there are separate regions which are you know trying to work out their own way. Southeast Asia is one; they wanted to be a you know a trading block with the United States, with China and Japan. The U.S. pulled out of it the famous uh, TPP, uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Agreement, which they wanted. At the end of it, it was RCEP. So now, of course, Southeast Asia does see an Asian uh, integration of the economy and their growth is linked to that. So you, you see in different parts of Asia forces coming out which want to work out for themselves what the direction right. should be. And also Africa. Africa finally is getting out of France, France's colonial grip over parts of the particularly Francophone Africa. Uh, large parts of Africa is also in play today. So Africa and Asia, and don't forget, this was Nehru, Sokarno, uh, imagination, including Nkrumah, uh, that this should be the Afro-Asian unity. And this, I will not say there's an Afro-Asian unity, but it's definitely true that Africa and Asia would like to work out for themselves what their future should be. And therefore, they are acting as a different set of poles in the world order today. And the weakening of the European Union and the United States in, in the way they dominated the globe after 1915, after the fall of Soviet in 1990, that period seems to be now coming to a close. Right. Thank you, Prabir. It's, uh, it's interesting how we started the coup in 1953, but in some ways its implications, uh, the waves from that coup and say counter currents continue to uh, you know, prevail in many parts of the world, especially in that region today. Thank you so much for talking to us. We next go to Thailand, which has been facing a political crisis since the elections a few months ago. The latest reports say that the Pew Thai party associated with the Shinawatra family has struck an agreement with the United Thai Nation Party of former Prime Minister Prayuth Chanocha. 
Private party is one of the forces being backed by the military. Now, this marks a realignment in the political spectrum as Pyutai has moved away from the Move Forward Party, which emerged as the single largest force in the elections. To make sense of what might appear as a convoluted situation, we go to Anish. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a bit of a confusing situation in Thailand. The last time we talked, I believe, um, a for Move Forward Party had been stuck. But the idea was that they and Pyutai might continue to work together. Now, it does seem like the Pyutai Party has sort of shifted positions. Yeah, so this has been going on for uh, a couple of days now. Actually, the speculation that, uh, in fact, even uh, during the uh, previous vote that we talked about, uh, there were already speculations that the, the military has been, or the military militaristic bloc has been making overtures to Pyutai uh, to actually get, uh, get them to back a government that will not include uh, move forward. So what we're looking at is a very, uh, very interesting situation where, uh, you know, former rivals in many ways, ideological and, you know, historical rivals are coming together uh, in an alliance that they say is for the stability of the country, but clearly is also, you know, part of uh, preserving the, uh, the former elite's control over the situation at the moment. Uh, what we're looking at is, uh, what is going to likely happen on uh, on the 22nd would be uh, a, a government where move forward will not be part of it. It will be kept completely out of it. And that also kind of creates a situation because it's just the United I Nation Party that is that has now declared support for uh, a Kuwaiti-led alliance. Uh, other uh, of the more conservative and royalist parties have not uh, given any statements so far. Uh, so it is quite, and it will be quite interesting to see how they're going to get the vote through because without Move Forward, which is the largest uh, party with over 150 members, uh, it is next to impossible to form a government of their own. And it will be because obviously, then you obviously have to gain support from the Senate. So, and that will be a more interesting situation because uh, that would mean that you will make significant compromises on a whole host of uh, matters, you know, issues. And uh, it will be interesting how Kuwaiti actually uh, plans to move forward from there and also, you know, hold on to its own base because that is also going to be very difficult at the moment. Uh, many of them did believe that the Kuwaiti would stand in an anti-militaristic and anti-conservative bloc. Uh, and right now they are uh, put in a situation where they have to back the party uh, that uh, will be in alliance with, uh, you know, uh, with some of the most hardcore conservatives and pro-military groups in the parliament right now. Right, Anish. So what does this mean in some ways for Move Forward also? It, it was a new party. It came to power on an agenda, like you said, which is kind of difficult, different from most of the other con conventional parties. And it actually won quite a bit of support uh, going beyond some of the traditional opposition bases. And it, of course, made a lot of uh, you know, made a, emphasized a lot that it wanted to actually repeal the less majesty law as well. So, what is the situation of the party now? Uh, the party right now is insisting on a second chance for Pita, uh, and that is primarily because it does not believe there is any established convention or rule that pretty much prevents anybody from standing again if they failed uh, in a prime ministerial vote in the parliament. And so they are trying to fight a case uh, in, the, in the constitutional court. They're also trying to push for the parliament to give, uh, you know, to uh, accept Peter's second chance. Uh, but it's 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 a very uh, tricky situation right now because they have not made any statement so far. They've not made any statement of either support or opposition uh, to this new alliance. Uh, and obviously, with that, you mean uh, there will also be no. Uh, you know, route map or uh, you know, uh, a blueprint for the for the for what their strategy will be in the next coming years uh, uh, under what might be a new government uh, by next week. And so this create uh, so we need to really wait and see how they are actually going to react. The re response has been quite slow at the moment, primarily uh, because they are also uh, believed by a lot of possible uh, litigations against them which might include dissolution of the entire party, which is not new in Thailand politics. Uh, but uh, And so they are probably at a moment where they want to focus uh, more on these litigations 
uh, to stave them off and also probably uh, push for a certain uh, ideological ground uh, within the parliament where you know established norms can be respected. That's pretty much their stand at the moment. Uh, but that is not what other uh, members of the former alliance actually believe in right now. So uh, it is quite uh, like also we are, we need to look at the base. It's uh, one. It is one thing to talk about the parties, but the voters who voted for these parties, uh, and we need to look at how they're going to uh, be, uh, you know, vote or you know, be uh, organizing in the next couple of years. How many of them will be uh, alienated by the situation, or how many of them will actually look for maybe other alternatives? in the current uh, political scenario. It is something that we need to wait and see. Obviously, things are going at a more, very glacial uh, point right now. It's almost three months since the general election results were declared, and there is no government, a proper uh, stable government yet. And so it, everything is going at a very glacial moment. Everything is uncertain at the moment. So the political situation, how it, uh, how it is going to evolve is something that we need to wait a little while. Uh, but the uncertainty is something that is not going to have a good result at the end of it, because obviously, well, if you're going to uh, disregard the anti-militaristic vote that is that was the overwhelming mandate of the recent elections, uh, that is definitely going to mean that there will be a different kind of movement uh, uh, in the horizon that uh, probably Kweta is not planning to deal with at the moment. Right, Anish, thank you so much for that analysis. We'll come back to you after the vote in Parliament, in case especially if there is any move towards government formation. And that's all we have time for in today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. And until then, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Watch our videos from across the world. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button on YouTube.